Alive, my search for the best ways to live is brought to you by our good friends from Living and Style. You can catch them on Instagram at Living and Style or check out their official page at livingandstyle.com.ph. That's living, the letter N, style.com.ph. I'm actually using this very comfortable uh, chair doing this podcast, courtesy of our good friends from Living and Style. Also brought to you by our good friends from Filipino Homes. Thank you so much, Filipino Homes. They've got a brand new school out. It's called the Filipino Homes Institute of Real Estate. You've got to go check it out if you want to dive into the real estate industry. That's the school to go to look for them on Facebook at Filipino Homes Institute of Real Estate or just check out at Filipino Homes. I'm sure you can find them there. As promised, our guest today is the general manager of the Mactan Cebu International Airport, Mr. Steve Dick Dikan. Hi, Jiggy. Mayung gabi, Jiggy. Thank you so much for doing this. I know you have a very hectic schedule. You just came off uh, uh, from a trip to Bantayan. You're opening a, 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 an airport there, from what I understand. It's nice to see you again after months. I know, I remember the last time we spoke, we, it was early in this pandemic. We were still grappling. We were starting to figure out what to do. In fact, uh, we didn't uh, get a lot of... Uh, things uh, settled when we, inter when we spoke because we were still grappling with what uh, this pandemic means to, uh, to you, to the Mactan Cebu International Airport. Uh, Steve, tell us about what's going on now. What are the changes that you have made? What, I, what is going on now at the Mactan Cebu International Airport and to just flying in general in the Philippines, in the world? Give us um, a sort of an update. Okay, thank you, Jiggy. Since you already mentioned the Bantayan Airport, I'll just plug a little. That yes, okay. uh, we are um, we have a project in Bantayan. Uh, it's the extension of the runway and um, the concreting of certain portions of the runway. And uh, it, I'm happy to say it's ahead of schedule, and uh, we plan to inaugurate by December. It means we wow. will operate also by December. Um, it's a very exciting project. Um, I think it will, it will be one of the gateways. Um, to the revival of our tourism industry. Now, um, uh, now going to your uh, question, uh, when we first started resuming flights, that was in June, those domestic flights, I had to fight for that, for the resumption of the flights because um, there were many reservations um, on the part of um, the LGUs as well as uh, on the part of the airlines and the authorities, uh, the national authorities. So uh, fortunately, I was able to get the support of all of the stakeholders here. Um, everyone was on board from on the Cebu part, and we were able to convince the national government to allow us to operate domestically. Um, come July, uh, we also had to fight for the international flights to resume. And um, it was an uphill battle until such time that they finally relented to allow us to resume uh, our international flights. How, how are the flights? It's bad. It's nothing, mm -hmm. it's nothing to, to be proud about. Um, we've had several projections since the start and we had to scrap all of these projections out of the mm -hmm. window because um, we did not, uh, it's impossible to anticipate, but, um, we were not able to foresee that um, the hindrance to the resumption is not really your ability to resume, but um, the, the willingness of people to allow you to resume. So you have the national government to contend with, you have the local government units to contend with, and you have the airlines to contend with, and you have finally the people themselves dealing with their anxiety for travel. So uh, we're now in, I think, seventh, the seventh iteration of our projections, and uh, I'm sure there will be more iterations to come. Um, the greatest hindrance to the resumption of local and foreign travels, really, um, our inconsistent regulations. Each LGU that, go to, that you go to, different regulation. We, we try to create a table of what are the regulations for each LGU, and it's a very long table. And um, what regulation they do state when you get to the ground, when you get to actually travel, the implementation is also different 
from the, the from what is the written regulation. And so on the ground, um, uh, they're not following what's written. So um, you have that uh, sort of inconsistency, and you will see people unwilling to take the risk to travel, even those that, willing to take, uh, even those willing to take the risk have difficulty traveling. They they arrive at check-in counters and be refused to board a flight. And so um, that's really the that's really the bad uh, development there. Um, so we've had only a few flights uh, um, that have resumed since then. What what particular destinations have more or less uh, less problems than than others? Is are there specific flights now, specific destinations, be it local or international? That are easier to fly. Yeah. To. Oh, well, um, yeah. Um, uh, Lapu Lapu City is a, it's a <laughs> uh, example of a uh, uh, relaxed regulations. And so it, it, um, and, um, it's, it's easier to fly to 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 to, to Cebu. You mean? No, Lapu Lapu. Lapu. Are you still there, sir? City or your yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. The, my my the, question, my question is, uh, yeah. Um, what what destinations uh, is easier to fly to from yeah. from from Cebu? Um, That's right. That's right. Is, is there a favorite yeah. destination now that people are are going to, and, and it's easier to fly? Meaning to say, the regulations are easier for 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 the for you or and for the airline industry to sort of follow, and the implementation and the rules. Are, are sort of the more predictable than the others? Yeah. Um, so uh, going back to what I was answering, uh, well, to my earlier answer, uh, Lapu Lapu City has less regulations than, say, Cebu City or oh, okay. Cebu Province. Okay. Yeah, so if you're a resident of Lapu Lapu City or your destination is Lapu Lapu City, um, the requirements will not be as much. Okay. Um, if you're a, a re returning resident of um, Cebu province, for instance, you'd, you'd be required to get a certain certificate. Okay. Same with Cebu. You'd also be asked to get a another certificate, a certificate of, uh, what was that? It's a new one, um, uh, like certificate of coordination, something to that effect, and, uh, and a uh, clearance, a travel clearance. So um, uh, even within our own island, <laughs> there, there are inconsistencies. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you can imagine um, when we go to the other places, also, uh, it, it's it's a bit tricky. Uh, so what um, is what is what, what is the what is the most frequently? Uh, Manila has uh, pretty relaxed so far. Manila has pretty relaxed requirements. Okay. So um, it's not that difficult to get to Manila. Um, it it's uh, the I think the most stringent requirements uh, come from uh, places like Davao, which requires an RT PCR test result or uh, you must be willing to get an RT-PCR when you arrive. Not to mention the 14-day quarantine. Uh, do they have that as well? Yeah, some of them have the 14-day quarantine. I have that, that list somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a funny. It's a, uh, if, if, uh, I'd have to step out to get that list. But yeah, there if, are... If, if you want to go on a, on a weekend vacation for two to three days, you have to stay exactly. there for 17 days. Exactly. <laughs> Doesn't... It boggles the mind. Uh, they, they could just have required a test instead of, um, uh, and some require, I think there was one that requires a test. And also, even if you're negative, it requires quarantine. For 14 days. Yes, yes. In your days. destination, in that specific destination. Yes, well, yes. What, what, what do you think is, is a reason? Yes. What, what do you think is a reason for this, Steve? Why is there uh, inconsistent and, uh, different rules per destination. I mean, we're fighting the same virus, more or less. This is, uh, you know, the same country, <laughs> you know what I mean? So what, why can't we have uh, at least flying requirements uniform all over the country? What, what, well, what is the, a hindrance? What is the hindrance from, from accomplishing that? Well, if you decentralize the decision-making for these protocols, you can expect that um, yes, yeah. different people, you know, different folks, different strokes, right? Um, some people will yeah, be more uh, conservative, some will be more liberal, some will have different balancing uh, interests to consider. Um, so 
we're seeing the effect you know, if um, there's no national or uh, uniform protocol. And um, when it comes to travel, there has to be one, um, especially yeah, in the in the national level, right? Um, it's very difficult to uh, require your um, domestic constituents uh, and, and those people in the country to have to uh, contend with um, varying protocols. Um, you must remember that uh, a, a uh, local traveler um, has a very short period uh, typically for spend, uh, that they will allocate for that travel. And um, the budget also of a local traveler is way lower than an international traveler. So you can't put too much burden on the local traveler. Less they're they're not gonna do it and, and just forget about it because you know um, it's so complicated and you know you have to stay there for 14 days for quarantine and all that yeah. stuff so they'd rather not do it not to mention the fear that they've already had right. uh, and is uh, still having right now That's so right. um the pandemic obviously by the word itself is is a global event I don't think you can customize your response to something that it's so universal. I mean, you can't get any more universal than a pandemic. It's the same everywhere hmm. across the world, not, let alone s within cities. So it's really uh, strange why we have to customize each particular destination based on uh, uh, whatever the leaders are in that, in that locale or, or in that city, right? Right. That's right. That's right. Um, we have to agree to a national policy. Otherwise, um, we, we might as well, say, uh, as well say goodbye to local travel. Um, so that's what is, in, that's what is stopping, uh, what, what is stopping, what is stopping anyone from, from doing that? Uh, that, that? That's in fact the reason why um, the airlines uh, are uh, not jumping on the opportunity to resume their flights. It's because um, they know that uh, even if they sell tickets, um, there's no assurance that the people who will buy them can take their flights, right? So that, that's a huge impact on their um, business model. And what's stopping us? Uh, there's nothing really. Um, I think there are, there are efforts now to create that national policy. Um, the airlines themselves initiated that effort. Um, they submitted proposals to the national government to uh, ask for a uniform um, protocol. And uh, the national government, through the DOTR, is discussing the possibility of that, of that uh, national protocol. Uh, Steve, I read an article a few days ago about uh, a study conducted about safety in flying. Uh, in fact, that article said uh, that it's not really as dangerous as we think it is. Um, Steve, how dangerous is it, or how safe is it to fly? Yeah, um, well, the, uh, there is that um, uh, pronouncement by uh, several uh, aviation uh, industry sectors, that um, uh, industry uh, groups, that um, because there's a sort of a filter that uh, regulates the air uh, in the aircraft, um, uh, it it uh, reduces or um, uh, makes unlikely the transmission within the aircraft. Right? So, uh, um, in terms of I suppose safety of the uh, passengers inside the aircraft, no other vessel or vehicle or trans mode of transportation is more safe than an aircraft. Um, in, in boats, uh, you move around a lot. Um, there isn't that HEPA filter uh, that the aircrafts have. Um, there's more likelihood of uh, you know, interacting with people rather than in an airplane where you, where you usually sit and um, your movement is constrained. Um, in, in jeepneys, uh, there's no um, temperature checks when you board. You don't know the people you're with. So there's no way of uh, contact tracing after. Um, in buses as well, 
in tricycles. So um, if you look at the safety mechanisms of an aircraft and, and the protocols that are followed, um, it's, it's the safest, but it does not mean it's 100%. Right? Uh, there's, no, there's no such thing nowadays. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, yeah, um, uh, there, are, there was even a study that, yeah, the HEPA filter helps, it reduces, but there's still a possibility that a um, that, uh, 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 person could, could uh, infect someone. But if you wear a mask while you're on board, then um, uh, it further reduces the risk. Uh, when you say HEPA filter, is this something that is required by all airlines to have? Yeah, all, all commercial aircrafts have that. It's a high efficiency particulate, a particulate, particulate air or something. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so um, it uh, filters, it can filter the, uh, the virus in, in, uh, in the air before it uh, uh, can go around. And also the, the way the air blows in an aircraft. And so um, that also reduces the way, uh, the, the likelihood that um, the people around you will get uh, infected. Uh, Steve, can you, can you uh, describe to us the kind of damage that this pandemic has brought uh, to uh, you know, the airline industry, uh, to uh, tourism here in the Philippines and all over the world? Uh, so there's no, nothing to compare it with. Um, in the modern day, uh, we, we have the luxury of travel. Um, in the past, that uh, travel was not as uh, frequent and was not as fast. So uh, the effect of this pandemic on our current mode of travel, I think will only be known in, in the years to come. I, would, I could hazard a guess, right? Uh, I, I'd say a lot of the airlines would go bankrupt. Or, but the more likely effect would be that a lot of the airlines will ground their airplanes. That would be, I think, one of the immediate effects. And it's already happening. And as a result, also, um, since there are so many airplanes that are not being used, um, there, the orders for new aircrafts will also stop, which means that the uh, manufacturers of the aircrafts will suffer gravely. Some of the air, uh, aircrafts that are about to be delivered can be canceled. So can, you can imagine how, how, how it goes, right? Um, uh, uh, probably uh, we were looking at a five-year um, period where there would be no aircraft orders. I think um, given the situation, that five years is optimistic. <laughs> it could even be worse, worse than that. Uh, so um, that's... It's off, uh, I think that's, that's um, one of the greatest impact on the aviation industry. Um, for the airports, um, the, the effect wouldn't be as felt, wouldn't be as uh, drastic as with the airlines. It would, it would really be the airlines that would be hit huh, in the aviation industry. The airports um, typically, well, well, it's very expensive to maintain an airport. And regardless of the volume of the people in the, uh, the, the traffic of passengers in the airport, um, the the uh, expense would be the same, would be roughly the same. So uh, in that sense, an airport um, is a, is very expensive to run. But um, so long as you've been operating for some time, uh, most airports have um, uh, have a cash cachet of um, of funds to uh, to to uh, to tide them through these difficult times. Unlike airlines. Uh, uh, no, on the uh, business that's generated day to day. Yeah. Of course, not. Uh, uh, I know the uh, the uh, damage economically that to, to the to the airlines and to uh, tourism is is historic. Like you said, nothing yeah. can compare uh, to this uh, in in modern history. It, and this is not, not just um, it's not just tour. Yeah, Jiggy, it's not just tourism that will be affected. Um, Travel, it's, it's, like the, it's like the lifeblood of our economy. Transport is the lifeblood of our economy. So um, if you stop the blood from flowing, you can expect everything along the way to suffer. So um, 
all of the industries, they're dependent on travel. And um, air travel is one of the, um, one, one, one of the, uh, has the greatest effect, I think, impact um, among, the all, among all other travels. And so um, I, I, I think that, uh, right, you're saying tourism, tourism. Uh, uh, the impact of um, the, the uh, pandemic on the aviation industry mm -hmm. Um, on the world economy, not just tourism, will be felt in the years to come. And, and not to mention the psychological trauma that uh, it has brought mm. to a lot of people, right? I mean, uh, we were just talking mm. about how safe, relatively safe it is to fly compared to any other mode of transportation because of the HEPA filter that an airplane has. So it sort of filters uh, the air that's uh, circulating in the airplane. Uh, but uh, just the, psycho the psychological uh, trauma that it has brought to people uh, who, who will probably never fly again for, for many years is, is, yeah. is immeasurable, right? That's right. Since the pandemic started, and then it's, a, it's a bit uh, ironic. The person who's working for this. And um, I, uh, taking a flight and returning home, uh, I, I'm sure, rather than the average person. And, but I still have the anxiety of traveling given the situation. <clears throat> so I can imagine that everybody has that anxiety. We hear this word a lot, uh, Steve, uh, pivot. Everybody's making a pivot. What sort of pivot do you think an airport like the Mactan Cebu International will have and how about the airline industry? What have you heard? What sort of pivot will airplanes have? Airline industries uh, have? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, uh, this has to do with a new paradigm, doing things. Okay. Um, before, when you travel, the typical scenario is that you buy a ticket, and then um, uh, when you arrive. Or before you arrive, you can choose a hotel, right? Of your, I mean, nobody really cares which hotel you're going to. You do declare it in your in your uh, immigration, but nobody reads it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then when you get to your hotel, you're also left alone to do whatever you want, right? Something happens to you, nobody really, you know, um, uh, bothers to to check on you. It's really up to you what you do, and. Um, uh, when you get back, you're also largely left alone. <clears throat> that can no longer happen in the new paradigm, the new normal. Everything has to be connected. Um, itineraries have to be set, registered. If you need to change items in your itinerary, they have to be recorded and they have to be reported. And um, you have to, to ensure, and, and that in turn, Will ensure that um, the places that you go to um, are are informed, pre-informed about your uh, going there, and um, the data can now check if uh, they have the carrying capacity to um, accommodate uh, the the guests. And then we can we also have to ensure that there's a way to treat them. There's a way to uh, uh, transport them. To the to the facilities that we have. So um, I was mentioning Bantayan a while ago, right? I'm actually yeah. excited about Bantayan because um, I think that it could be the scaled model of how the new paradigm or the new tourism normal will be. Okay. Um, if we are able to do a good system for Bantayan, and uh, uh, we are able to show it uh, that, that it's effective, that this integrated system of doing tourism can be done. And um, if the stakeholders of Bantayan will, uh, will um, all co or cooperate, because if one of them does not, this whole system will fail. Um, so we need the cooperation of all the LGUs in the Bantayan Island, the three of them, Santa Fe, Bantayan, and Madridejos. We need to have all of their 
tourism stock stakeholders also buy in on this on this idea hmm, so that it will work and um, if we can do it and we can show that um, that the way we deal with the guests can be done in a coordinated fashion um, we can even ensure that uh, because we have an airport to airport facility Maktan and uh, and Bantayan um, we can even ensure that um, immediate med medical attention can be given to these guests. We can get uh, medical insurance for each tourism traveler for just to get tourism started again. And um, uh, all, um, all of these measures, if, if, um, if it's done properly, and we can show that that Bantayan uh, can safely go about tourism, then the decision making of the people to travel uh, can be, um, uh, uh, we get to be in the mix of the places where people will decide to travel. Now, it's very important at this stage to be in that mix because the pandemic was a equalizer for all the tourism destinations. Um, Boracay, Shargao, uh, even uh, all of those places out, outside like Thailand, they're all at zero right now. We're all at z ground zero right now. And no matter what marketing you put into these destinations, it's all for naught. It will only become valuable at the time that people begin to decide to travel. When people begin to decide to travel, they will choose a destination. And if you are marketed right, they will choose your destination. So it's very important to be in the mix of the places where you choose to travel. At that time, people will decide. If we, so, we get so into that mix. That so you're saying that the Bantayan Airport will be a uh, sort of like a good study, a yes. showcase of yes. what potentially can be done anywhere else in the Philippines. If That's you can right. make Bantayan work, meaning to say, if tourists decide to go to, to Bantayan and feel safe to go to Bantayan, and it is indeed safe to go to Bantayan, then uh, you can use that model for the rest of the countries. Is that what you're saying, Steve, sir? Exactly. That's exactly what we want to do. Um, and we want to go further than um, inviting tourists over. We want to bring them there. Okay. So we'll, we'll, what we'll probably do is, um, you know, uh, invite, invite some tourists, some people, who, influential people, you know, those especially in, in social media who have a lot of followers. We'll invite them over and we'll show them how it's done, how it's being done. And um, they can then... Uh, uh, spread the word and we can have a, some coverage on how we're doing it and that will create the marketing needed so that um, when the decision to where to travel is being made we're in that mix and people say oh tourism is being done in Bantayan safely in this place in the Philippines it's a very lovely place I hear so many good things about it so uh, that, we want to be that ahead requires, of everyone like else. you said, it requires a lot of coordination, not just from the LGUs, but also yes. a lot of help, a lot of assistance from the from the national government, right? Uh, I mean, this is something that yes. uh, it, you have the would. right infrastructure. But that, that's why we did a scaled. We want to do a scaled model because if we made it too big, it would be very difficult to um, conduct. But I, uh, the good thing about is it's one island, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh very limited places of entry uh, and uh, also of exit so uh the coordination is really within that island it's, it's uh, more in the, within that island and um the i think this is the perfect time to get everyone on board because everyone's suffering and everyone wants to do something to help so uh and also the revival of the uh, the the um, accreditation of each tourism <clears throat> um, destination or uh, enterprise 
is being done right now. And so um, the requirements, in other words, the requirements for you to resume your operations um, are being drafted right now and being uh, approved right now. So we can put that in, require them to, uh, to comply with the protocols that um, we will need in place. So uh, you mean to say that there's going to be a lot of paperwork involved. It's going to be a, a, a more complicated now to open, let's say, a resort, a hotel, and you can't just open one without any uh, sort of uh, approval from the at least the LGU, right? Not so much the paperwork. Um, we did this. Uh, you know, there are so many online systems right now. In fact, we did a pre-registration system for the airport. This, these are information we've never had before. And it's a very valuable tool. The pre-registration information gives us all of the data about the person, where they're going, uh, where, what's their eventual destination, um, where did they come from. Um, usually before, uh, it's just immigration that would have that and they would have it on paper and they wouldn't really record it in the database. Now we have that. We just have to push it further, not just the airport, cover everything everything that a person has to go through and um, share that information to the, to the tourism industry. Um, are there more people flying out of Cebu now or are there more flying in than out of uh, Cebu? What, what's it like right now in the airport? Where is the busyness coming from? If Mostly coming in. Okay. Mostly coming in. Uh, coming, uh, that's, a, that's a problem. Uh, most flights. A lot of flights come in with the full load or uh, near full load and then when they go out just one, <laughs> just 10, just 30 people on board. Where are these people usually coming from? Um, a lot of them are stranded people. Okay. Oh, um, a lot of them are also returning OFWs. Okay. Returning residents uh, from abroad. So you don't see any new tourists coming in yet? Oh, cannot accept tourists okay. right now. It's, okay. uh, it's only those authorized to travel who, who, who come here. You know, this is a, 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 a coronavirus. It's a novel coronavirus. So that means it's you and a lot of things are still uh, up for grabs. We still don't know a lot of things about it. But more or less, we're already seven, eight months into it. So we, we have a lot of uh, sort of information that we can sort of crunch. Um, based on the information that we have, uh, Steve, um, when do you think, I know you've already, it changed your, uh, your, your forecast seven times you mentioned earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very, still very unpredictable. Uh, but um, maybe you can make an eighth one tonight. Um, uh, where and, and um, at what point do you think will things go back to uh, uh, what they call a new normal. They're saying that the light of the end of the tunnel is really the vaccine. Uh, and they're saying that the vaccine is coming up very soon. Let's say an uh, early next year, perhaps, or, or, or middle of 2021. Uh, when do you think things will start to pick up in your best mm. estimation? Well, I'll, I'll preface my answer. Um, okay we're talking about new paradigms. So we also have to have a new way of thinking. Um, a cure is good, but um, the possibility of it coming soon, I think is, is uh, well, even so if, let's say, even if there is a, uh, a, 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 a cure, a vaccine, um, will it be safe? That's the first question. We don't know the long-term effects yet. Second is, will people be willing to take it? And that's a bigger question, I think. So, wishing for a cure, I think, is not the way we should be thinking. Um, the way we should be thinking is, let's assume that the virus is here already. That's the way, that's really the way we should be thinking. Let's assume the virus is here already. What can we do? So, if that were the way of thinking of all the governments, all the LGUs, national government, then the response will be, let's have treatment facilities. Let's have quarantine centers. 
let's not anymore talk about blocking people from moving around uh, because um people will be moving around anyway right uh you're, you're just uh, uh putting hindrance to recovery right um so um i think uh all of these checkpoints all of these um uh requirements for uh, for uh preventing people from traveling um they're not the right way to go the the right way to go for any local government unit right now is to ensure that they have a way of treating someone who is positive so if you have that then you have you should have no fear of getting back to your normal and um if we have that also we can have a stability of sorts that um, will enable the transport sector particularly the air sector to resume its operations so i don't think that's going to happen anytime soon either because yeah. um changing people's thinking that's also a very difficult um uh thing to do and so uh very expensive too yeah so if if i were to make to hazard a guess on when we when we'll get into the new normal i'm not talking about when we'll go back to how we were back then so never my, my, look like my, it, right? my hands are you know but um just to just for us to um sort of uh relax all of our protocols and allow um businesses to resume allow people to travel um i think that won't happen within the year i was hoping that um by, by middle of this year it would happen but given the situation i don't think it's going to happen within the year maybe um maybe uh when when uh there are there's news of a vaccine and um that euphoria that uh of having that news will be the uh catalyst for people to relax so even if they're not taking any vaccine uh they'll feel safer and really it's all psychological um the anxiety people are having um a lot of it is real and a lot of it is just psychological and, um same with uh, if you find a cure um the the uh, assurance that you will have a uh, part of it will be real part of it and just be you know um, uh, an overestimation of of how safe it really is and so um but um I, i would hazard that would be the that would be the turning point so sometime the, the next, maybe yeah when when uh, somebody claims to have made the vaccine that would, that would be the turning point in my opinion probably early next year but there are all those things that you mentioned that uh, you have to consider like whether number one you can afford to have everybody vaccinated number two if people will want to get that vaccine and number three if yeah. it is safe but um, so granting granting there is already a why, vac- vaccine um, yeah. well, all those three consider, things can... yeah why consider it to be a turning point is the psychological impact okay of someone saying that there's a vaccine it's like um when somebody cries wolf even if there's no wolf um people will get scared and when prob- somebody says uh, like in that movie in that indian movie um uh, all is well right all is well and then people the psychological impact okay. also on the people even if it th- there's inferno outside they'll, they'll say ah all is well so <laughs> it's, it's not i mean um, i think that's a, that will be the turning point because of the psychological impact so it, this is really uh uh, uh mostly psychological Mm. uh it, that's what you're saying but you also mentioned uh that uh we need to have all, all these uh health uh, protocols uh, made uh, uh we need to know that uh, there's a place that we can treat those that are found to to be positive um are we going into that direction as well let's let's just say there's already a, a, a vaccine and you know uh, people have this illusion that things are are better than they they once was because they they are vaccinated um but we still need to have those things that you mentioned we still need to have a facility to have people checked right because 
this is an, a coronavirus that could evolve and mutate into something else. It could be, it could be some, some other uh, virus next year and we'll have to start from scratch again. So I think we need to have those things, uh, these, those health facilities that can treat people in place already. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think Cebu is in a good trajectory. You know, we have okay. testing capabilities now. Um, we have a lot of quarantine centers. Um, a lot of hospitals are capable of dealing with uh, coronavirus patients. Um, tracing, uh, contact tracing um, is also being done. And um, we have some apps to do some contact tracing. So uh, we just have to you know, uh, work some more to um, harmonize these all and uh, develop uh, it further. Uh, Steve, we have a lot of people watching, hopefully, and listening to this interview and are just raring to fly again, willing, uh, raring to travel again. Uh, what is your, your message to all those uh, uh, who can't wait uh, to uh, board an airplane and, and go somewhere different again? Yes, uh, you know, you really can do it now. You know, traveling um, is not restricted. Um, it's our, our airport is open. Uh, there's, there are just some protocols that you have to follow. And um, you must be you know, one of those classes that, that uh, are authorized to, to travel. Now, um, especially in our airport, uh, we have the testing capability. We're one of the few airports that uh, can do it ourselves. And um, if you are traveling, for instance, to a place where they require PCR test results, whether domestically or internationally, we can do it for you. In fact, that's what one of our offers now. But, uh, if, you're, if you need a PCR test result for departure, we can um, do the test for you. And the good thing about our uh, laboratory is that um, we are recognized internationally. Huh? Like um, all the other airports, all the other destinations, um, they know about our laboratory here in here in the airport. So um, they, uh, they um, in fact, some of them require that the, the test result must be from the airport, not from any other provider. So, so it's really one of, our, of the benefits of um, flying from the Maklan Cebu International Airport. Um, we can help you out. And uh, if you have any other requirements, also we have a one-stop shop that can um, uh, help facilitate some of the some of the, the issuance of these requirements. Um, the, we just have limited routes right now. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, interconnectivity, I don't know about the protocols of the other countries. So you have to do the research for that. But um, if you really need to travel, you can do it. And um, I would say that if you do it, um, you're doing everyone else a favor also because um, you will show that um, travel is can be done safely and um, others will follow that example if enough of us do it. So are there enough flights being offered by airlines now to travel as well, both domestic and, and uh, international? Yeah, um, for, for um, international flights, it's gradually ramping up. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, we're fortunate to have Qatar Airways, it's a, it's a new player, and um, mm -hmm. it's doing flights every day. And Going our old where? Qatar Airways, um, it's, uh, I think it's Doha. Okay. And, um, uh, and um, Emirates is, has resumed flights. Um, Cathay has also resumed flights. Um, some of our Korean uh, airlines have also resumed flights. So um, uh, internationally, uh, we're increasing every month. We're increasing the domestic. Uh, for a time, we were doing quite okay, and then uh, Manila was closed off, so um, a lot of flights were canceled. But now Manila has resumed, and we now have other domestic destinations. Okay. Um, to name of. To name a few of our domestic destinations, um, we have uh, Zamboanga, we have Tacloban, uh, Davao, Depolog, General Santos, uh, Cagayan de Oro. 
So um, these destinations uh, uh, have just recently um, uh, re reopened for us. Uh, before the uh, because of the um, um, because of the directive of the DOTR to have a uh, GCQ to GCQ flights. So all of these destinations, both domestic and international, that like you mentioned, they already have flights, but it is still up to the individual uh, uh, to know what are the requirements to that destination, right? So each destination, be it domestic and international, are different. That's right. That's right. That's a tricky part there because each uh, destination has its own requirements and um, you have to really check what are the the requirements there? So there are no casual travelers now. You can't just go and decide hey, I'm going to go to Kagayandi or tomorrow and have a weekend there. You, no, nobody is doing that anymore, right? No, if you no. if you have to go somewhere, if you have to go to Doha, it's not mm. just because you're you know it's for fun and games or for leisure. It has to be uh, something uh, thoroughly more important than that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. That's right. So um, there are classes of travelers that are allowed. The, the OFWs, returning OFWs, uh, locally stranded individuals, the APOR, the authorized persons, side of the residents, um, uh, people who need to do travel, like the businessmen, um, people who, who who have loved ones who who, who are deceased. So. Um, you so have to belong to a class of, of sort of the travelers before you can actually uh, travel uh, uh, to all of those destinations, domestic yes. or international. Uh, Steve, I, would, I, would, I just remembered I was having a conversation with, with a bunch of friends of mine, two of, uh, of my friends who own uh, air, uh, air flying schools. And, uh, you know, we were, we were talking about how there's a big problem of, of uh, you know, having enough pilots because there's a shortage of pilots because there's so many uh, flights now and, and there's so many uh, destinations now that are opening up mm -hmm. and all that stuff and travel is very affordable so everybody's traveling and for us to have that conversation just months ago to this is just like you said mind-boggling it's 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 just mm -hmm. crazy right Right. We, we were projecting that there would not be enough pilots for the aircrafts that were being ordered. Exactly. There would not be exactly. enough flight attendants for the aircrafts that were being ordered. So, uh, in fact, the, the, um, the standard for the flight attendants, for the pilots, have been relaxed a bit over the years just yeah. to ensure that there would be enough. And um, they were even looking at the possibility of having less pilots in a flight. Like uh, typically, there's a requirement for a number of pilots to be in an aircraft, depending on the duration of the flight. Um, not, uh, at, for a time, they were thinking of reducing that number, just to ensure that there would be enough um, pilots who can uh, man aircrafts. Also, the experience requirements were uh, being reduced. Um, but with with this development, where uh, um, a lot, I think a lot of people are losing jobs. I, I, remember our, I, remember our, I remember our conversation uh, uh, last year when we when we first had you live in in the studios, uh, that we were thinking of of you know trying to to reach uh, you know a certain number of of tourists like twenty million yeah. or thirty million just like Thailand right who has that number of of tourists yes. back then just last That's right. year. That's right. It's just crazy, man. That's right. Oh, that's crazy. You know, I, I took up piloting and I was, I was joking around that um, if, if, the, uh, if the shortage of pilots becomes drastic, I'll, I'll start, um, uh, if I get a license, I'll start flying planes. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not happening anymore. It's a, I don't know, um, things that we really, uh, we were all really looking forward to this growth. These are just crazy times and the changes that is happening is just, uh, it's difficult to wrap our heads around. Um, it reminds me of a quote from Anthony Bourdain when he once said, change, nothing ever changes. So I guess we are living in turbulent times and this pandemic has showed us that, uh, you know, you'll never know what's going to change tomorrow. 
So yeah. I guess what we need to do is to make sure that uh, we are nimble and is ready to make a change. Uh, the, that's the only constant thing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, what is your what is your final message for for everyone watching this podcast? I was going to wrap it up uh, 15 minutes ago when I asked yeah. you about. Uh, your message, but uh, uh, what's your final message to everyone, at least final for the time being, because I'm sure I'm going to want to have you again around, yeah. you, you know, you, you're, the, you're the only person to have been in the podcast three times. Most of them only wow. come in once. So you're, yeah. So what is your message um, third time around to all those watching this? Go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, we should be gearing towards a new paradigm. Right. Um, uh, I think that um, the old way of doing things, it's no longer, sustainable it's no longer feasible so um if we have to gear towards a new paradigm we have to change our way of thinking you have to change the way of the way we're doing things you have to be more open to these changes right? change is constant so uh so i'll just leave with that message right and um we're doing our best catch, to cope. I hope to catch you again uh and talk about the uh, bantayan airport what, what is yes. the official of the Bantayan Airport. Uh, so uh, what's, what are you working on? What sort of name do you uh, have for that? We're, we're doing three things there. So uh, one is uh, uh, the main, of course, is the runway. It's the most okay. important thing. So uh, we, we, if, we, uh, um, if we are successful with our project, um, we can fly turboprops. So turbo, wow. uh, unlike before, where, where you just have the general aviation planes carrying a few people, on board, maximum of like 15 people. But with a turboprop, we can carry more, much more people. And it will make travel to Bantayan cheaper. And um, uh, uh, we are also doing the perimeter fence um, to, to ensure the security uh, and safety of the airport. And we're also redoing the terminal. So what's the official name of, of the Bantayan airport? Oh. Oh, for now, it's um, Bantayan Island Airport. The island is in parentheses. Bantayan. Okay, Bantayan. <laughs> but um, I, th I, 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 when I last visited, when, when I was there, they were saying that um, the Santa Fe municipality was um, uh, trying to pass a resolution to change it to Santa Fe Airport. <laughs> I hope that that, that that doesn't get bloody. <laughs> I don't know. The name, uh, they're the name also trying to do that in, in Mactan, right? They're also trying to change it to Lapu okay. Lapu Airport. Lapu. <laughs> but it is December. I mean, like, uh, there's no stopping uh, Bantayan Island Airport. Uh, it's going yes. to be opening at least uh, this December. That's right. That's right. That's right. I, I, I'm even confident that we can open earlier. But um, I want to inaugurate wow. December just to be on the safe side. All right, I hope to be there in your inauguration. Then. Thank you yes, so much, the please. general manager. If you can find time. If yes, you can I find will time. be there. Uh, the Maktan, yes. I will certainly be there, uh, Steve. The mm -hmm. general manager of the Maktan Cebu International Airport and the Bantayan Island Airport, um, Steve Dikan. Thank you so much, man. It thank is you. always thank a, you. a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, thank you, Jiggy. Pleasure also. You stay safe, sir. Yes, you also. <laughs>